Stand with me, please, for the reading of God's Word and open your Bible to 1 Corinthians find chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 1, get right on into the message this evening. We're going to restart our series on spiritual gifts. We'll do that with a recap. And then, and then we hope to reset the focus on what it is we're trying to achieve and what spiritual gifts are all about. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're looking at verse 1. The Bible says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. And we believe the scriptures are given to us by inspiration of the Spirit of God. We believe that the Holy Spirit of God took up the Apostle Paul and through the Apostle Paul wrote these words for us. And so we believe this comes from the Lord. The Lord does not want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. It's important for us to understand them properly. And that's our mission. That's our objective. Father, I pray you'll help me tonight as I restart this important series on spiritual gifts. I pray, Father, you'll help us each one to have ears that hear and eyes that will see, hearts ready to receive what you have for us that we might be instructed by you. You said your spirit would guide us to all truth, and we're looking for that promise where two or three are gathered together. You'll be there, and we're looking for you, Lord Jesus, to speak to our heart, to shepherd your flock, to feed us, and to help us see what you want us to see tonight, this message. In Jesus' name, I pray for that. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to go over sort of like the outline of those messages we've preached uh, in that set or that subset within the larger study. Uh, the larger study, spiritual gifts. Lately, we've been looking at understanding spiritual gifts, trying to get, our, get a handle on what they are about. What is the point of spiritual gifts? What is the Lord doing with spiritual gifts. And we said the church is where it's at. I'm going to start with that statement as far as launching into the message proper, and I'm going to come back to that statement at the conclusion. The church is where it's happening. I remember when I was a kid, we'd ask each other, hey, where's it? Ha what's happening? Or where's it happening? Or where's it at? I can't remember now what we used to say as kids. It's been that long. <laughs> But what's happening? We'd say that a lot, right? I can tell you right now what's happening. Whatever's happening in the spiritual realm, it centers in the church. You'll see that, I hope, clearly by the end of the message if you don't already appreciate that. The Bible says our Lord Jesus Christ started the church, of course. Upon this rock, I will build my church. The rock to which he's referring is himself. That rock which followed them in the wilderness. And uh, according to the Apostle Paul, by the Spirit of God in 1 Corinthians 10, that rock was Christ. So Christ Jesus is the rock upon which the church is built. Uh, the foundation of that, uh, of that construct is the apostles and the prophets, with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, and uh, then we are its builders. The foundation is set. The foundation is complete. We are proceeding now in an ongoing effort to build up the church. The foundation of the apostles and the prophets is complete. That means we don't have apostles in the sense of the apostolic gifts. That is, we have no additional apostles added to the 12 apostles of the Lamb. That's it. There are no more inspired apostles and so on. Likewise with the prophets. We have no more revelators. We have no more persons who are carried along by the Spirit of God to add revelation. The, the Scriptures are complete. The foundation's complete. And now we're building on it. The Bible says we are laborers together with God in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. As we work together with Him in this business of building up a house of habitation for God by His Spirit. And by the way, I'm just remember reviewing. So we're blowing past some stuff we spent time on a while back when we went through this together. Uh, he gave to the church the keys of the kingdom. Now, what is that all about? Well, we talked about it some. Let me give you a summary. Basically, it's kingdom authority. It's authority to act uh, under his authority. So we have the keys of the kingdom. It gives, us, it gives us authority, kingdom authority. Specifically, authority in the physical realm. And interestingly, the scripture stipulates that authority is expressed in many, many ways, but primarily in the area of healing. He gave them power to heal all manner of sickness 
And that's the physical intersection of the power of the kingdom and the authority of the kingdom in this world, in the physical world. And then he gave them power to cast out devils. That's the authority to act in the spiritual realm. And so more on that later on. In fact, I'll be doing a series on that coming into 2020. Our primary mission in the use of these keys is evangelism and edification. We want to build the church through evangelism and edification. In evangelism, we talked about going and plowing and sowing and watering and reaping. Under edification, we talked about feeding and guiding and defending the flock of God. And we offered some insight into the body principle. And to summarize that, each believer has a particular place in the body of Christ, assigned to them by the Lord, whose body it is. Each member is placed in the body for God's pleasure and for his purpose. There are three serving sections of the body, the head, the hand, the feet. There are five functions of the head, to lead, to feed, to build, to establish, and to steward. There are, keep it up. Okay. Again, just recapping, running back through over the outline. Uh, don't worry, we'll settle down and preach here in just a minute. But uh, uh, there are three basic functions of the hands, the free to serve and to help. And then the feet, of course, have one overall and essential purpose. That's to move the church forward in its mission. And that is essentially to evangelize, to reach everyone, everywhere with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The terms of surrender to the conquering king. Our Lord came into the world. He bound Satan, spoiled his house. He conquered. He rose again, declaring all powers given to me in heaven and on earth. Having then been given all the kingdoms into his power, he left to us his goods and with that, his power by the Holy Ghost, he departed to heaven to build for us a place there and to establish or to receive another kingdom, a kingdom that will be eternal and that will be established on the earth when he returns. All the kingdoms of the world are his now, and he's left us with the keys of the kingdom and the goods of the kingdom to go about doing the work of the kingdom while we're waiting for him to return. And when he returns, of course, we'll come back with him as he'll come for us first. We'll be with him in the, king, in the um, judge's seat of Christ. And then we'll be prepared to be presented to him as his bride. The church is the bride of Christ. And with our Lord, we will return to the earth and he'll establish his kingdom. Well, the point is, all of this stuff about spiritual gifts, it comes down to this. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he ascended into heaven, of course, even actually before he ascended, he, blew, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Spirit of God, for the first time in the history of mankind, actually in the first time in eternity, took up residence in the heart of a man. And now the body of the believer is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of God dwells in his temple. And the heart is the holy of holies of the temple. And the and Christ, represented in the Old Testament by the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, is the Ark of the New Testament Covenant in the Holy of Holies in our heart. Christ in our heart, the Holy Spirit crying, Abba, Father. And so the Holy Spirit in our heart. Jesus had a vision that from our belly would flow rivers of living water. So we talk about the anatomy of the New Testament temple, that the body is the temple, the belly is the door, and the heart's the Holy of Holies. And out of our belly is to flow rivers of living water. Mysterious, odd to think about, no time to develop, but to say, that's what spiritual gifts are all about. That's the point. That's the Spirit of God in you, manifesting through you. Amen. Hey, that, was, that wasn't bad, you know. All that, right? You, you got to get that. <laughs> you got to get that's important. Get that. The whole point of spiritual gifts. It's all about the Holy Spirit in you, manifesting through you, showing Christ to others. And when you get right down to it, that's the point of spiritual gifts. Remember, Jesus conquered the world. He sent the Spirit, His Spirit, into our hearts. The Spirit of Jesus Christ in us holds back the Spirit of Antichrist out there in the world. Satan is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works upon the children of disobedience. That's the spirit of Antichrist, which John said has already come into the world and it's been here a while. And the spirit of Antichrist works toward establishing 
setting the stage up for Antichrist to appear, or the capital A, Antichrist to appear, the man of sin, the son of perdition, for him to appear, rise up in power, take over the world. The Antichrist spirit wants to dominate, wants to take the kingdom and do its own control, wants to enslave men, wants to kill, maim, and destroy. The Antichrist spirit is a spirit of tyranny. The spirit of Jesus Christ in us is the spirit of liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And the spirit of the Lord through us holds back the spirit of Antichrist out there. And as believers grieve and even quench the spirit, they give place to the devil so the Antichrist spirit can increase in strength. And you just heard the story of America. In the day when the spirit of God was flowing freely through believers' faith, this was a land of liberty as Christians have retreated and bought into the lies of Satan and there are so many the spirit of liberty is retreating. Now greater is he that, in us, that is in us than he that is in the world. But just as in the Old Testament economy, so is it in the New Testament economy. In the Old Testament economy, they had all this power. They had this great glory from God. They had the Shekinah glory in the tent. And they had all these things going for them. But the Bible says they limited the Holy One through unbelief. And we're doing the same thing today in the New Testament. We're limiting the Holy One by our unbelief. All of that to get us here. Open your Bible to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1. That's your recap. We just reset for spiritual gifts. Now we're going to move forward and talk about spiritual gifts. We'll be getting into this word of wisdom and all this stuff and explaining all that, helping you understand it. We'll be talking about this whole business of the gift of tongues and going through all that. We've only done that at Lighthouse Baptist Church about 570 times, but who's counting? We'll do it again as part of this series. We'll make sure we're clear and understand that whole business. But right now, coming back to the statement I made earlier, the church is where it's at. The church is where it's happening. Let's look at Revelation chapter 1 and begin with me at verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, and the Lord is speaking here. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty I, John, that's the Apostle John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit. That's a good place to be. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps of the golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like in the fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him... I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell, hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter the mystery of the seven stars, which thou saw us in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. And then in the first letter to the seven churches, Jesus is represented as walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. John sees him standing there. And as the revelation begins to unfold, Jesus takes a walk. 
And where is he walking? He's walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. What are the seven golden candlesticks? The seven churches. What are the seven churches? The seven churches represent the Lord's focus and his work in this world today leading up to his return. They represent the development of his churches over the period of time from the time he departed, really in this case, from the time that John was given the revelation to the time that Jesus Christ will return. First for us and then with us to the earth. The seven churches. It's interesting to look back over the Old Testament how the center of God's activity in the world has always been with his people. A people called out and called by his name. He's always done that. I mean, we can really get into this and start and talk about Seth uh, in, the, in the days that he, Enos was born, his son, that in those days men began calling upon the name of the Lord. And how from that line of Seth we come to, well, finally Noah. And then uh, from Noah who found grace in the eyes of the Lord, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem was taken up and that family bore the name of the Lord. And it goes on through history like that. And yet in every case throughout, God is always through that people reaching out and bearing witness to his glory and his power and so on to everybody else. For example, when he called Abraham, he, Abraham's call was that through him all the nations of the world would be blessed. So God wasn't narrowly focused only on a certain group of people. God's focus has always been for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His focus has always been the whole world. When he called Abraham, I will bless all nations through you. God had a vision for blessing everybody, but he picks a people, puts his name upon them, and uses that people to send forth that blessing. He's always done that. And you go through history, he brings Israel out of Egypt, and he's got a congregation called Israel. They are a nation under God. He uses those people to be a witness to all the other nations. And we've gone over enough time, won't take any time to go further into it, but to say we come into the New Testament time, and guess what? He's doing it today as well. Satan succeeded at corrupting the Old Testament priesthood so that God took the Shekinah glory from them, turned the glory of the kingdoms over to Nebuchadnezzar, and then from there down through history till Jesus came at a time when Satan could boast all the kingdoms of the world are mine, and Jesus took him on and took the kingdoms and has them now. And Jesus Christ has organized his sovereign rule over the earth He's organized it so that he sends his blessing through his people. And we who were not a people are now called the people of God. We are gathered in, we're grafted into that old trunk, and we're made the people of God. And we, his people today, are the people of God. And through us, God will do whatever work he's going to do. And the point I'm making is, whatever is going to happen in this old wicked world, it's going to happen through the, Lord, the Lord's dealings with his people. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. It's always his people. And when we look at Revelation, we come to the end of the whole thing here. This whole drama is uh, uh, coming to its crescendo. And we come to the conclusion now. And John... The revelator, and I said, it's all about uh, the churches. I said, it's happening, the churches where it's happening. And, and somebody might get a little disturbed and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, Jesus, uh, jealous for Jesus' glory, and you ought to be, and that's good. But uh, jealous, being jealous for Jesus, well, no, 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 the focus is always going to be completely Jesus. Well, I get that. And that's true. And there's no question about that in our passage. <laughs> when Jesus, when John turns and he sees Jesus standing there, it's a rather overwhelming moment. But what I want to point out is something I brought to your attention before. Listen carefully because it's worthy of repetition. Notice when John the Apostle turned to see the voice that spake with him being turned, what did he see? Seven golden candlesticks. And standing in the midst, he describes the glorious manifestation of Christ 
as he's manifested today in and through his churches. Now, wait a minute. Let's go back over that again just in case you missed it. John's on the Isle of Patmos. He's in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. He hears a voice behind him. This voice says some pretty amazing things. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Whew. Like a trumpet. And he's thrilled and stirred and he turns to, well, he turns to see the voice. But when he turned to see the voice, what's the first thing he saw? Seven golden candlesticks. What are the seven golden candlesticks? The churches. Who's directing his attention? John turned to see a voice, but when he turned, what he saw was seven golden candlesticks. So we're scratching our head on this one. And now we contemplate this vision he sees. Jesus Christ. His hair is white. As snow, his eyes as a flame of fire in a face that's shining like the sun. Last time I looked at the sun, I went blink, 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 blink for a while. Last time I looked at the sun, all I could see was bright light. I couldn't see much else. And anybody here who's looked at the sun for at least something in the measurement of nanoseconds, because you don't want to look longer than that. Just a glimpse is all you need. And you go, whoa, right? And what's my point? Who's looking at a face that's shining like the sun in its strength, which means it's shining like a noonday sun on a clear day? Who's going to be looking into a face like that and going, oh, check out the eyes. They're like a flame of fire. Eh? Unless you are being supernaturally enabled by the Holy Ghost. Unless your eyes have been massaged with that eye balm that is in the, in the shepherd's bag that he uses for his sheep to help them see clearly. Unless you have been ministered to by the Holy Ghost in a special supernatural way. Well, unless you're in the Spirit on the Lord's Day and you're looking guided by the Holy Ghost. And my point is, therefore, when the Lord Jesus Christ stood before John... And John turned to see him. Jesus said, hey, first, look at these. See these. Your focus is there. Look at that. Seven golden candlesticks. See that first, John. Wow. See that first. You see, when Jesus died upon the cross of Calvary, the Bible says he endured the shame. He suffered all that reproach, all that humiliation for the joy that was set before him. It doesn't take a whole lot of work to put the scriptures together to show that the joy set before him was that treasure, that treasure his father spied in a field long ago called the world for which he sold everything that he had that he might buy the field to secure the treasure. That pearl of great price. That's the treasure. It's the church. The church is where it's at. Today, in Christ's economy, Jesus is focused on the church. He's not walking up and down the halls of the UN. What a waste of time that would be. He's not even bothering to prowl the halls of the White House. He isn't spending or even, he's not wasting any time at all moving around whatever the capital is there in China. Is it Beijing? He's not over there fussing with Kim Jong-un or the rest. His attention is on you. Hello. His attention is on his churches. We need to wake up and understand that. Whatever's going to happen in the spiritual realm that will work itself out in the physical reality because that's how it happens, you see. The spiritual and the physical take place in the same place. You understand that? It's important. Right now, there are angels in this room. Some of you probably brought, brought, brought a couple of devils, too. I wish you'd left them home. But there are, there are spiritual entities in this room right now. They're not in some other plane, some other dimension. They're right here. The spiritual and the physical 
are in the same place. And the relationship between them is dynamic. What happens in the physical affects the spiritual. What happens in the spiritual has impact and effect on the physical. When you pray, things actually occur. Things actually happen. Because we're dull and we don't understand and we don't see that. We just pace through our prayers as if they're a me- almost a meaningless exercise when what you don't understand is if you pray like you ought to pray, you'll get more done in your hour of prayer than you'll get done all day long. I mean, in terms of real things happening in the what we call the real world, there isn't an, there, there isn't an unreal one. But anyway... The things that happen in this life happen coming uh, out of uh, coming out of uh, interaction with spiritual things. I'm saying all that for a reason because we need to understand when we're talking about spiritual gifts, we're talking about the intersection between the spiritual and the physical. We're talking about that moment when a spiritual gift manifests that the spiritual makes an appearance in the physical. And that's what spiritual gifts are about. They are about the Holy Spirit manifesting Christ in us and through us in the world around us. And if we're letting that happen, and when I say let that happen, I actually mean let that happen. You are a king and a priest unto God. And when God gives titles like that, he's not just throwing things around and playing some kind of little game. This is meaningful. Revelation 1 verse 5, you are now, hath made us. He didn't say, he shall make us, he will make. The tense of the verb is hath, past tense. He's done that already. He's made you a king and a priest. As a king, you have authority in his kingdom to represent him in this world and to, well, to do things. That we'll go into in that series I told you we're going to get into next year. I don't need to go into a great deal. You understand. You preach the gospel. You command all men everywhere to repent and to believe on Jesus Christ. You say to this mountain, be thou, uh, be thou removed and cast into the sea. You say to this tree, be uprooted and cast into the sea. You have spiritual authority. And you're not, we're not talking about excavation or deforestation. We're talking about spiritual activity, things that happen in the spiritual realm. You declare unto this or that, you declare to that wicked mountain that's raised itself up and opposed Christ in China, and you say to that mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. And when you have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, things start shaking over there, and things start happening. When Olympus, the proud Olympus was raising itself here in our country and still is in the deep state, when proud Olympus was raising itself up and, and, and Zeus was making a bid for control, and I'm speaking metaphorically, you understand that, right? I'm not, I didn't watch some weird cartoon that I'm talking about. This is, I'm speaking in a metaphor here. But when Satan, from his seat in Pergamos, began doing his thing to raise up a power in this country that would consume our liberties and bring us under tyranny. And we began to pray that God would bring down that proud mountain. That's when we began to see the proud mountain crumble. It's when we began to pray. And somebody says, well, that's only for the great big churches. Most of the big churches, not all, not all of them, some of the big churches are very strong and awesome and dynamic. Lancaster's got one. Uh, There's a church there in Hammond, Indiana. Uh, I don't know, 10,000, something like that. Pretty good-sized church. They're on target. There are some good churches that are very large. Don't misunderstand me. But in the main, most of the so-called mega churches are mega jokes. They're huge dog kennels. That's what they are. They're goat pasture. Or the... Whatever sheep might be there are surrounded by a bunch of goats that will eat anything you throw at them. If there are any sheep there at all, there are a bunch of uh, dogs all around eating their own vomit. If there are any sheep there at all, they're backslidden and cold-hearted because they feel, they feel comfortable walking around in the slop of pigs who are wallowing in their own mind. You, you, you get what I'm saying. A lot of these large churches are just, they're, they're mega jokes. They're not mega churches. 
God can save with few or he can save with many. God can do amazing things with as much faith as, the, as, a, faith as a grain of mustard seed. It's really amazing to me. Peter was walking on water. He began to sink. Jesus said, Oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? You realize it takes less faith to move a mountain than it does to walk on water. There's a woman that came to Jesus for healing and she is petitioning him for healing and he's ignoring her. And you've heard me go through this story before. It's, it's one of the most moving stories in the Bible, in my opinion. Here's this woman. And she's not even an Israelite. but She comes to Jesus for help for her daughter. And she's begging for help and he ignores her. And then, and then he speaks roughly. I, you know, I've not come but for the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. I mean, you know, it's like rebuff, rebuff, rebuff. We pray and ask for something. God doesn't answer the way we want him to. We're mad at him right off the top practically. But this woman, she just kept coming back, coming back, coming after him. She didn't give up. Finally, he turned to her and said, Oh, woman, great is thy faith. We don't understand what great faith is and what a little bit of faith is. Most of us don't have the kind of faith that woman had. Most of us don't have enough faith to walk on water for five seconds, much less the ten seconds that Peter lasted. How much faith does it take, however, to call down a mountain or to uproot a little wicked tree, men as trees walking, bringing forth evil fruit, corrupting our children? How much faith does it take to uproot those wicked old trees and get them cast? Faith is the grain of mustard seed. Jesus said it doesn't take, it doesn't take very much. There's great faith and there's little faith and there's all that. But Jesus said, man, when it comes to this, mustard seed faith, that's all you need, just a little bit. I don't know if you're catching this. It doesn't take a lot of faith. So how woefully, how woefully small is our faith? I believe that when I open up my atlas and I lay it down in front of me with my Bible open in front of me and I lay my hand over China and I start calling down that wicked mountain, I believe God's doing something when I do that. I don't think it's just a wasted time. I don't think it's just a vain exercise. I think things are happening. Likewise, when I talk about what's going on in America, and I pray for the president, and I pray for the vice president, the cabinet, and his um, press secretary, and then I pray for the Congress people. I don't go through them all name by name. There are a, a few choice names that God hears me talk about quite often. Not always in a positive way, but certainly I'm praying. I hope they get saved. Anyway, my point is when I'm praying like that, I'm believing God's doing something. I don't believe I'm just getting my prayers done. I believe that I'm getting work done. Getting things done. Important things done. Important work done. Now we come down to the things going on in your own life. You've got a child that's wayward. You've got bills, perhaps, that have accumulated, accumulated on you and you're under a burden. Or you've got... I don't know, some kind of concern about, I, who knows? I mean, there's so many things, am I right? We got plenty of cares, don't we? He said, cast all your care upon me. He said, cast all your care upon him, Peter said, for he cares for you. And Jesus said that over and over and over again. He talked about how, hey, what are you worried about? You worry about what you're going to wear. You worry about what you're going to eat. Father takes care of all these things. He knows you have need of those things before you even ask him. Oh, ye of little faith. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all those things will be added to you. That goes back to my exhortation during the offering. It's about trust. If we trust the Lord, we know where to get our problems answered. If we trust him, we, we know. If we trust the Lord, we know where to get our needs met. If we trust the Lord, we know what to do. Pray. <laughs> Cry out to him. Call on the Lord. It doesn't take a huge amount of faith, that woman, to get a favor from God with regard to blessing her family. That required more faith than it would take to bring China down, the, the apparatus, the strongholds of Satan in China that's keeping the people there in slavery. God organized it in such a way it takes less faith to take care of that than it does to take care of these things that we're talking about, all these little needs you have in your life. It's just amazing to me how he organized this. 
But please understand me right now. Tonight we're going to have a prayer meeting. When we go into a prayer meeting, we're going to get some stuff done. I'm talking serious stuff's going to get done. Man, I remember when we were concerned about that uh, Jennings character that was appointed to take care of school safety and was introducing the gay agenda thing. I remember when we targeted that thing in prayer and it wasn't, it was, with, I can't remember the exact amount of time now, but it was very shortly thereafter, not too long, he was out. I remember when we wrote a letter to Barbara Boxer and said, you know what, you as a senator, you support abortion, that's a murder of babies. We were kind about it. We, I don't know if I call it kind, but we were, I mean, we didn't rail and rant like idiots, but it was an intelligently written letter and we just asked her to resign. Well, she didn't come out and make an announcement for resignation. We never got a response to the letter, but she didn't run the next election. She stepped down. Now, it doesn't, it's not hard for me to believe that God listened to prayers and he acted. Now, we got to trust him. See, it goes to trust. I got to trust him. Now, what I want is for it all to happen yesterday. I like that verse that says, he answers before you ask. I'm wondering about all these things I'm going to ask for that he hasn't done yet. Right? I know. I get it. I'm there too. It comes back to trust. If you don't trust the Lord, you'll quit on him. You'll quit on him. He warns us, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season, what will happen? You shall reap. Why do you say that? Don't be weary in well-doing. In due season, you're going to reap. It's because he knows you're going to reap. And he also knows you get weary. He knows you get weary. Our time frame, his time frame, very different things. We don't happen to have all of the knowledge he has. We don't happen to know everything he knows. We got to trust him. But he told us that if we had faith as a grain of mustard seed, we could say to this mountain, be thou removed to yonder place. Or be thou removed and planted into the sea. And likewise with this tree, the sycamine tree, you might say the sycamine tree, be thou uprooted and, and planted in the sea. And when he said that, he, it's each time it's in a context of exercising spiritual kingdom power in each case. It was in that kind of a context. And when he said that, he wants us to trust and believe him and go to him and pray. Because we are kings and priests. That means something. As priests, we go before him. We have access to his throne. We can go right before the Lord by the miracle of the omniscience. Uh, I'm sorry, the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit. When we are in the Spirit, we are in his presence. Right there. In the Spirit, in his presence. Because the Spirit is omnipresent. We have the uh, uh, amazing privilege as priests to come before God on behalf of man. And we have the amazing privilege and responsibility as kings to go before men on behalf of God. I mean, we, the church is where it's at. The church is where it's happening. Or it's where it's not happening, if you get my meaning. We have the keys. The dynamic, powerful motor of God's power doesn't roar into action until somebody turns the thing on. Somebody's got to turn the thing on. You can sit in the car and you can have a 400 horsepower motor in there and you can just sit there and it's not going to go anywhere until you turn it on. The same thing is true of the church. The church is the most powerful institution on the planet. The power is here. Not in Washington, D.C. The power is here. Not in Sacramento. The power is here in his churches. Well, we've got the keys. Let's stand together, please. 
So when we get back into our study of spiritual gifts, you'll understand what it's about, what the point is. We're not talking about, oh, how neat is that? Word of wisdom. Boy, that's neat. That's not, give me a break. This is about Christ Jesus manifesting in assembly and acting in this world. That's what it's about. So we need to use the keys and exercise the authority we have as priests to go before him and pray in faith. Don't need a lot to get a whole lot done. Good to build your faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. What you're doing is a faith building exercise right now. It's faith building. Great faith is what we need. But you know what? You can get a whole lot done with a little bit. So start with what you have. And everybody has at least a little. He said he gave to every man the measure of faith. Everybody has the measure. Personally, I think that's what you need to get saved. He's dealt that to every man. You got to build on that and grow on that. That amount must be smaller than a grain of mustard seed. Man, it must be itty bitty. But will you tonight, when we break for prayer, get serious in your prayer time? I realize some of you are like me in some ways. I mean, uh, you, you, you can't really get into your full, fervent prayer mode in, a, in this environment. I understand that. I don't, by the way, object to that. I think it's fine for you to do that. I've been in some prayer meetings like that. And I don't have a problem with that. I just know personalities. I understand. But at least get the motor going and start warming it up. So when you get home, you can just let it roar. All right? But let's pray tonight when we pray. Okay, church? Let's really pray. All right, that's the invitation. Let's respond to our Lord as we conclude the service.